Welcome to General Counseling Live, our special webinar on the legal outlook for crypto and blockchain. I distinctly remember when cryptocurrencies came exploding into my world. It was 2017, so by no means a pioneer. I had heard of Bitcoin, having had it explained numerous times, but I still had no idea what it really was and certainly had no idea how to buy any. Then, one sunny morning, my business partner, David Crocker, came into the office with a particular spring in his step. He'd invested in something called Ethereum at $35, and it had doubled in a week. A new app, Coinbase, made it really easy to buy into. So, wrapped with crippling FOMO, I made my first crypto investment, Ethereum at $55, which probably doubled in about a week as well. It is now worth $2,584 per ETH. Within a few weeks, the rest of our team had serious crypto fatigue with various members of staff hodling through thick and thin, neglecting the day job to constantly refresh their Coinbase accounts. Within a few months, we were holding various baskets of obscure altcoins, getting excited about new ICOs on, ex on new mysterious exchanges that sometimes didn't work. Then, in 2018, the market for Bitcoin, which had peaked at £10,000, crashed, losing 70% of its value in three months. The rest of the cryptos followed suit. I certainly thought that the party was over, that we'd look back on crypto as a sort of adult playground craze that would disappear as quickly as it had started. I was wrong. The Bitcoin peak in 2018 was £10,000. The price today, after a couple of months of downward pressure, is £28,500. Many of the big institutions that were decrying crypto assets as trash are starting to offer clients crypto products. Bitcoin is seen as a competitor to gold as a potential store of wealth, and non-fungible tokens from top artists are selling for north of $60 million. All things crypto have become catnip for the financial press. Whatever one's views of the relative merits of digital assets, one thing that does seem inarguable is that crypto is here to stay and blockchain technology is going to create a host of new opportunities and risks for financial institutions and the professionals who work in them, not least within the legal and regulatory field. It is a new frontier and in today's General Counseling Live, we're gonna explore the legal and regulatory considerations for the market. There are very few genuine expert legal minds in crypto and blockchain, and I'm delighted to say we have three of them joining us today. From CMS, Cameron McKenna Nabarro Oswang, Charles Kerrigan is a corporate partner with particular expertise in blockchain, digital assets, and AI. He's rated by the Legal 500 as the go-to person in London for funding intangible and digital assets, and an advisory member of the Bank of England's Financial Markets Law Committee on Virtual Currencies, the UK all parts of party parliamentary groups on artificial intelligence and blockchain. So he knows a thing or two. From in-house, James Sullivan is the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel at crypto and currency payments exchange platform Zigloo, having previously steered the legal team at Challenger Bank Monzo during a period of rapid growth and change. James has played a leading role in a disruptive, fast growth tech-driven companies since 2018, helping establish the infrastructure and in-house legal capability and working on legal solutions to help these businesses scale and grow. Coming from a regulatory perspective, Rosalie Pretorius is a partner in Simmons & Simmons' top-rated financial services regulatory practice. Rosalie's practice historically covered the regulatory environment across global markets, trading and market infrastructure. She's been recognized by the FT's Innovative Lawyers of the Year, and has recently been spending time developing Simmons' expertise in the digital assets market, chairing seminars on the contrasting regulatory approaches to the market across Europe and Asia. Thank you all for joining us. So if we start looking at the opportunities within crypto and blockchain, there's been lots of focus on the industry, especially in the press, on the speculative FOMO-driven retail-led investments in Bitcoin and ETH in particular. Uh, what do you guys see as the positives <clears throat> blockchain technology can bring to the financial services market? And Charlie, if I send that your direction to start. Okay, Thank <clears throat> thanks Tom, and um, thanks for the invitation. Um, 
Well, gosh, where to start? So I I had an introduction to crypto that was a bit like yours. I I was interested in the technology, and then I liked the people, and then I uh, disappeared down the rabbit hole. Um, but I figured that it was relevant to my job um, on the basis that uh, some aspects of it would leak into traditional financial markets. And so it would be worth knowing about because the financial markets would borrow something from crypto and these new technologies. And it took me a while to work out that I think whilst that's true, um, equally, this is a huge market that stands in its own right. So uh, because of the volatility, it's difficult to put a, a, a total market capitalization across it, but somewhere between uh, one and $2 trillion just for the coins that we're describing here. The enterprise value of these types of technologies is, is some way beyond that, as it sits in behind a lot of financial innovation. I think um, from a, a financial markets perspective, we can see there are challenges in the financial markets in terms of um, customer experience and customer retention and attraction, the kind of um, institutions that were relevant to people uh, maybe of my age uh, look less relevant to the millennial, millennial generation. And they are used to the kind of gamification that crypto brings, the kind of community aspects that crypto brings. So I think there's a challenge for the traditional markets to look relevant to the, um, uh, the, 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 the folks that are looking for banking partners and have grown up with gaming and technology firms. I, I won't do the advert for James's firm here, but, but, but firms like Ziglu are, you know, I think, buying into that philosophy that people are looking for something broader in terms of the engagement as well as the underlying um, uh, products and, and financial um, uh, 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 accounts and similar that, that are traditional. James, do you, do you want to look at that from, from somebody who works in, in, a, in a business that is at the, the cutting edge of this? What do you see as the um, positives that the blockchain move to blockchain is, is creating? Yeah, so I think you've got kind of two aspects to this. One is on the, the blockchain te technology itself, and then there's the other side is on the crypto side. So block, block technology, blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology is, is effectively re revolutionizing the concept of that ledger of record. And I think it's its use case is only just starting to um, like be known to us. I think that some of the, the technologies that we will see um, are, will completely disrupt financial services as, as we know it. And, and that in itself will open up um, increasing competition and that can only be good, good for, for consumers um, for example, it can uh, it can give more um, assurance around authenticity of transactions and ownership. So that, that's just on the blockchain side itself. And then there's the you know, there's the crypto side. So I mean, a bit a bit like Charles says, there, there are, there's definitely a market out there that wants to engage in in cryptocurrencies. Um, and um, I mean, to some extent, there are there, there's definitely competition out there. We're certainly we're certainly not you know, you know working in a in a sector without competition. But if you go to your traditional financial services institutions, your traditional banks, you, you're probably not going to be served well in terms of cryptocurrencies. So there is a burgeoning new um, sector of, of um, financial services companies that are also regulated. We know we're, we're regulated as an electronic money institution, as well as being registered under a, under the new money laundering regulations. A whole lo a whole load of new crypto firms that are offering different products and services to to serve that, that customer customer need. And there are there are a lot of people that want to engage with crypto out there. Um, there are there are um, it's it's a it's an underserved market, but it's still I think a growing market. It's still a relatively niche and early early market. And Rosalie, from from the perspective of you know, you, you probably see a, a reasonable cross section of businesses that are involved in this, from new crypto market entrants to bigger investment banks uh, who are who are starting to offer this sort of things to clients. How, how would you describe the ecosystem of blockchain orientated businesses in London at the moment? I mean, I know people talk about Coinbase a lot because obviously it got so much attention because of its flow. What, what else? How would you describe the, the London space? 
think one of the key things is what James was just saying around the different applications of um, distributed ledger technology. So it's not just a case of those people who offer and deal in coins. So you've got the crypto exchanges, you've got the crypto wallet providers, and you've got those that are already registered like Ziklu, and then you've got those that are on the uh, temporary list. So you've got that class of people. But then you also have people who are creating their own tokens. So we are seeing quite a bit of that. And then we are also seeing, um, uh, I suppose, two other areas which um, are worth mentioning. One are institutional clients, both on buy side and sell side, now wanting to have some form of look into the market and trying to work out how to do that, whether it's, for example, through um, uh, participating in stablecoin projects or um, possibly through offering their clients derivatives or structured products around crypto rather than actually being in crypto themselves. Those are certainly developments that we are currently seeing. Or whether they are people who are actually providing the infrastructure for all of this. So people who are developing these products, um, people who, and, and of different types. And there are different types of network. I was going to come back to the question around distributed ledger technology, that it's much, much bigger than coin because there are potential, it's that immutability of record, which James mentioned, and I think Charles touched on this well, which is so attractive, I think, to the financial services industry, because we deal with records in so many areas. If you think about shares or bonds or trade finance documents. So there are many um, applications. So you've got central securities depositories looking at the blockchain. You've got um, trade finance supply networks looking at the blockchain. It has many applications and is very interesting. And I completely agree that this has the um, potential to completely overhaul financial services as we know it. I mean, we even have now, as you probably know, and I'm not going to talk about it in much detail, but central bank digital currency um, is certainly something which is now very seriously being discussed by very um, important by, by, by central banks worldwide. And it's going to be very interesting to see at what point and if um, we follow the digital yuan on that. So I guess that's a long-winded answer to say there are many developments in many directions, Tom. But, so, so Charles, because there's been a lot about the stable coins and, and like central governments being moving into this space. Charles, Charles why would it, what's in it for a government? What, you know, we heard Rishi Sunak talk about maybe doing a Bitcoin. What's in it for him? Why would they do it? Uh, so. Um, I think there are positive and negative aspects to it. So what's in it for them is uh, control of money. And that's in a positive sense in the, the, the technology enables the government, the central bank to have a direct relationship with citizens. So we hear about blockchain being a disintermediating technology and intermediaries come and go. Sometimes they're valuable, sometimes they're less valuable. The philosophy behind uh, Bitcoin and these, um, uh, a DLT is generally to take intermediaries out of the picture. So from the government's perspective, it can work with a central bank, the Bank of England, and it can have a direct relationship. Citizens can have accounts at the Bank of England. That's revolutionary. And we probably don't go there because if we do, uh, there may not be much call for the existing incumbent banks and we'll have some sort of uh, head scratching to do around policy and, and how we unpick all of that um, so there's a there's a, a, a defensive aspect as well because the governments can see that there are stablecoin projects developing as, as Rosalie says there are um, a, a there are projects that are being facilitated by the national banks and there are projects that are being facilitated by private companies and stablecoin projects are uh, difficult in regulatory terms to to um, to work through, and they're, they're taking a bit of time to go through the works. But they are uh, potentially the kind of thing that will move money across borders and start to uh, lower the barriers that some of the uh, policymakers have relied on to run their economies. So that that was the thing that was so controversial about the Facebook Libra project, now renamed DM, that. Uh, an organization with that reach had the possibility of uh, making, um, uh, re really throwing a spanner in the works of the national policies of, um, uh, of financial policy makers. So, so this, is, this is big stuff and it's difficult stuff. You know, there will be some unintended consequences along the way and there'll be things that people 
uh, want to back up and decide with hindsight they would do differently. But, but but as the others are saying, these are the biggest questions in the economy, not just around banking. I like the idea of quantitative easing through stable coins where they could just send us the money rather than give it to the investment banks to pump up asset prices. It sounds like a very sensible, innovative way of uh, distributing government investment into the populace. Um, James, looking at how well the industry is currently served, London is obviously super famous and well known for it, the quality of its support services for international finance. As the chief operating officer of a, of a fast-growing crypto exchange, how do you find the support you get from accountants, lawyers, and, and others for your business at the moment? Uh, well, obviously, we've got two, two leading experts on, on the call today. <laughs> <laughs> so those people on the side, and I've worked with Rosalie as well. So, um, I, but if, if I look at this kind of more big, bigger picture, like it's still it's still an emerging area in, in terms of practice. So, you know, there are certainly um, every, every firm will say that you know that they're working on this stuff, and they'll, they'll they'll have some payments lawyer that's kind of dabbling in a bit of crypto on the side of their desk. And I guess what what as a as a client, what we're looking for is and I think in, in all areas, not just in crypto, but ultimately when, what you're buying when you're going to a, you know, a, 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 a big um, full service firm is, is market intelligence, first and foremost. It's not just about law. Like You don't need someone to tell you this is what the regulation says. What you're looking for is someone to say, this is the regulation and this is how you know, your whole competitor set are solving this problem, how they're tackling this or how they're thinking about this. And that's, what, that's the value, actually. And until, you sort of, until we've got this ecosystem of law firms that are, are really plugged into the, the broader uh, crypto ecosystem and actually do understand really, really fully and have embraced what the problems are and how they're being solved, um, I still think it's, um, yeah, I still, honestly, I think it's still, with, with one or two exceptions, obviously two people here and a few others I, I work with as well externally, um, I do think it's, it's still fairly niche, actually. And what do you think, if you, if you were going to advise someone who was looking to, you know, develop their practice in this area, what, what could they do to make them of more value to you? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's really just understanding you know, it's not just about tracking, you know, what the, the regulatory change changes. I mean, we all, we all get the, that material. Yes, you know, it's useful to get it kind of in your inbox sooner rather than later um, and, and get, a, get a summary of that. All that stuff's really useful. But actually, what, you know, what, you know, what you're really looking for is someone that is really at the forefront of, of some of the problems that are being solved. And, and that's just about being instructed by, you know, the companies that I've got these problems to solve and, and on, a, on a, you know, on, a, on an industrial scale. So I guess it's about like demonstrating you've got a really real, real, uh, like genuine interest in, in this, in this, in this space, and then going investing and learning about it, both just, just the market and, and the, and, and the, also the technology, and then leveraging that to actually apply that to legal practice. And then I think that in itself will be a springboard to, to other work. On one of the, the the press jump on the relative successes of some of the older, the, the more old fashioned investors in the crypto markets. There was the fund Ruffer made a billion dollars on a crypto trade recently. I think there's a thing in the Times this morning about another major investor that had, that had done something similar. Um, and then you look at the investment banks you have by people like JP Morgan, you know, on the one hand, they've got their chief exec saying, he thinks it's awful and you wouldn't touch it. But on the other hand, they're also going to sell it to high net worth clients. Charlie, from, from your perspective, what have you, what have you seen the more uh, traditional financial services providers do um, in the crypto space that you think is interesting? And are there any interesting first mover advantages you're seeing from, from people that are among the more traditional providers of FS? Yeah, so I, I think our experience is a bit like what Rosalie describes. So the um, the existing clients want education on this, and uh, they're probably in a different position to where James described. So um, th there are a number of incumbent banks who are publicly uh, averse to crypto. So they not only will not deal in crypto, but they won't deal with anyone deals in crypto, which I think is an extraordinary uh, position to have reached in, in 2021. I can see uh, the risk um, aspects of that, but the opportunity cost, I think, of taking that position is, is pretty significant. Um, so we're generally, 
with the incumbents working through questions that they have around satisfying client demand and ensuring that they're doing it in a relatively risk-free way. So not taking the assets onto their balance sheet, not being responsible for private keys in a way that they don't feel comfortable with. And then the other end of the spectrum, exactly as, as James is saying, that the, uh, the newer businesses are more interested in um, who do you work for? What's everyone else doing? What's the market intelligence? And that's the, that's the fun bit because you feel as a lawyer, unusually, that you're part of something that's going on. People are interested in your view of what's going on, what will happen next, what's the regulator's position likely to be on rules coming down the track. So you're partly advising on the rules, you're partly advising on the market practice, you're partly advising on the commercial aspects, you're partly advising on what are the rules going to be this time next year, you're advising on um, if you need to get a license application through, it's not just a case of filling in the form, it's how long are you going to take to get a response and do you need to launch the product in a different jurisdiction to the one that you start to be uh, that, that you would naturally think from a business perspective. So it's it's a much broader range of questions than we're often asked as a lawyer. And, and everything gets commoditized, but at the moment, crypto is not commoditized. It, it makes it hard, <laughs> but it makes it interesting. And um, what, I mean, it's, see, you mentioned the point earlier on, like the, 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 the enterprise value in crypto is is huge, but also very difficult to quantify because of the, um, the amount of um, ups and downs. What could, if you were a founder of a crypto business, what are the things you can do to create the most amount of enterprise value and, and make your organization most attractive to investors or acquirers? Um, so, well, I'm probably not the person to answer it, but I think it's the traditional um, metrics in technology. So it's about scale and reach and land grab, those kind of the philosophy behind um, big tech is is pretty equivalent to what's going on around crypto. If you can, you don't have to have the best mousetrap as long as you can get people to uh, be excited and interested in dealing with your mousetrap and have some brand and, and, and momentum around that. that. That's the thing. You've got to get reach and engagement. So we've, we've looked in the first bit of this on, on the opportunities, which are obviously huge. The risks are also reasonably, uh, you know, significant in this space. Rosalie, if, if you were to sort of summarize the legal, if for institutions looking to get into the crypto markets, what are the key legal and regulatory risks they need to consider? I think the key thing that you, you have to decide to start off with is what exactly is it that you're going to be offering? Are you going to offer a service to do with an existing cryptocurrency, for example, or are you actually going to create your own coin? Um, if you are going to create your own coin or token indeed, then have you got somebody who can actually analyze that for you and tell you whether it's within the scope of regulation or not? And then once you've reached a conclusion on that, and by the way, we've got literally an index of different types of coins that we've and tokens that we've analyzed against financial regulation, then you need to work out whether you need a license and and in addition, whether you need a registration. So James has already mentioned um, Ziklu, that they have both a license as an e-money firm and a registration um, under the um, money laundering rules. And the reason for that is that that's just the way the UK rules currently operate. And a number of other jurisdictions operate in a similar way, but not necessarily exactly the same. So you've got to kind of work out what is it you're going to be doing and who you're going to be offering it to and where are they? And once you've worked all of that out then you would have to work out what is the risk in each of those jurisdictions do you have to go and set up there can you do it on a cross-border basis and so on and so forth there, there are a lot of questions on that and, and how are the regulators coping i mean you know it must be it's quite a big ask you've got this insanely technical new asset class which is favored by retail investors who you know if speaking from personal experience don't really know what they're doing but are pouring money into into these assets it's a completely new area and you've got to regulate that i mean that must be 
I think it's extremely difficult for them right now because I think they're really worried about consumer protection because mm. if something really bad happens in this space, then they might have a lot of people losing a lot of money. Then you'll have parliament coming to them and say, well, why didn't you do more about it? So they have banned various things. Um, in the UK, you probably would have seen the MIFID ban on derivatives and notes around um, crypto, but that's limited. It's not that's a ban which affects already regulated firms. It's not necessarily the same thing as telling those who are unregulated that there are certain things that they can't do. Also, um, in fairness, they've classed all the different coins in different ways, tokens in different ways, and some are still outside of the scope of regulation. And there are a lot of consultation out there. There's a lot of consultation out there deciding or thinking about how and whether to bring these inside the scope of regulation. And I, I think you can see how they're struggling when you look at what's happened with the anti-money laundering regulation um, registrations, that um, the, there are a number of firms that are in a temporary regime, and it was all meant to go through this year, and that's been postponed till next year. Um, which is really quite a long time frame. So I think I think the regulators are finding it quite challenging. I think that finding it challenging because of the whole retail um, angle um, and consumer protection concerns and anti-money laundering concerns, but then they've also got the wholesale concerns and the way in which um, various institutions are looking to set up systems which could potentially, as Charles was saying earlier, undermine um, financial stability. So for example, the coin, which is now known as Diem, um, they were going to go with Switzerland and they were going to be a Swiss payment systems operator, but they've moved back to the US. And I believe the Swiss regulator spent a long time, you know, looking at the system and how they might actually regulate that. James, from, from an in-house perspective, how have you found interactions with the, uh, with the, reg with the regulator and, and um, how... Do you, how, do they, I can imagine, they le are they leaning on you guys for sort of help and how they, how they actually regulate this, this space? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you know when Ziglu was 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 um, conceived, you know it was really built on a on a strong foundation of regulation, which I think is one of the kind of recommendations I would give to others. You know, and I, you know we we've reaped the benefit for that. You know, we're one of five firms now that have got the crypto asset registration. I might say that again throughout this hour, um, um, as, as well as being regulated regulated for e money. And I think, but I I think that puts us in a in in, in good stead um, in terms of um, our position. Um, uh, with the regulator, and we, we we show that we take it seriously. Um, but but that said, you know, like looking at this more broadly, I think the, the regulator, is, as Rosalie said, they're really concerned about confusion, like confusion between for for, for retail consumers that are engaging with financial institutions, and they they take for granted that there are a whole load of protections that come with that. So they engage with a the bank, they get a financial services compensation scheme. They you know with the with the, the broader sector, they you know they get they get protection through the financial ombudsman services. Some of, you know these these type of protections, which you know. Re reality is that we retail uh, consumers don't don't uh, read terms and conditions. You know they will skim through them like we all do, right? Um, and so they, they, they the, the regulators scared that there's going to be some you know big crash and that you know uh, investors will be um, will lose money and then they'll go and look for recourse and that recourse won't be there. So that that confusion risk piece is you know is is really really important. Um, but if but equally if you look at some of the research and discussion papers that have been have been um, released over the last few months and sort of Rosalie sort of mentioned some of those the big focus is on financial promotions at the moment like how 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 firms like Ziglu can actually market its products and services to to retail investors in a way that is fair you know fair, clear fair and not misleading but also ensuring that you know that pro appropriate risk warnings have been have been given so I think that's going to be the big focus what risk warnings that we will need to, to give to consumers but at the same time, I also think you know the, the regulator reckon, recognizes this is still a fairly niche market, right? And I think that gives us a certain amount of leniency. So the consumer research report that they they, they issued last year said that there's only like less than five percent of the UK population that owns cryptocurrency, and 50 percent of those hold less than thousand pounds. So it is still a small market, and I think that in itself means that some of that 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 sort of regulatory oversight is being built while it's still small, so that by the time it's bigger, it will it will be you know it will be there. Charles, Charles, do you think when we see like crypto adverts on the bus and on the tube at the moment, do you think that'll that'll look like when we used to see Benson and Hedges adverts in magazines? It's probably not going to be. It's probably not going to be there forever. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I agree with the others, and I, I think um, yeah, we're we're all 
um, trying to move this on together. There's no question that the backlog and, um, and pushing the date uh, back as Rosalie described is, uh, that, that doesn't look good uh, for the industry in the UK and it doesn't, um, it doesn't assist with the kind of innovation that the politicians are keen to support and bring through. Um, we also know that the other side of that, so I, I agree with uh, what James and Rosalie are saying, that I, I make the plain devil's advocate here, not because I disagree, but because I agree, but we, we, all three of us will be aware also of the fact that the, the FCA report that James described had a question around, um, you know, do you think this stuff is risky and you might lose all your money? And everybody said yes. Uh, so um, it, it is true that there are valid consumer protection issues there, but it's also true that um, a lot of people who are operating in the space have a, a, a relatively sophisticated understanding of, of where they're at. And then the second thing is um, a very influential US regulator, Hester Pierce at the SEC, um, uh, it gives very good um, analysis around banning this stuff will not stop people getting exposed to it. So we need to find ways of, as regulators and probably as, as legal professionals, ensuring that people are engaging with it in a way that they can get the exposure that they're interested in doing. Because trying to push it out of the, um, uh, trying to push it away so that people can't get exposure to it will not have that effect. It will mean that, that people are getting the exposure to it through uh, things that are completely unregulated or don't have a connection to the jurisdiction that they're in. This is a, you know, these are digital assets, they're intangible by definition, they're international. W what we're talking about, and Risley touches on it, often uh, people with projects who haven't got experience of raising funds before will come and say, yeah, we want this to be available to every person in the world and every country in the world, they can all invest a dollar. Um, and um, not be mindful of the securities regulation that's been established in, in every jurisdiction. So we've got to find with the regulators some way of striking that balance between uh, letting um, projects stand on their own two feet without exposing people too greatly, but also not just saying that we, we can't let them happen because that will have the, the, one of the unintended consequences that I was talking about before. Rosalie, how regulatory savvy, in your experience, are the are, are some are, are, is the people are the people looking to set these businesses up? I mean, you know, if you're looking to provide traditional financial services, normally you're, you're coming from like heavily regulated environments, and you you know you know what you're you, you need to be careful about. I guess this is an area where you're going to have a whole load of people who are very tech savvy, but probably, as Charles said, have no idea that may not know what the SEC stands for, let alone what they could be. Uh, in trouble with if they go wrong. How tech savvy, or how sorry, regulatory savvy, would you say the people- It all depends on who you're dealing with. I mean, if you're dealing with an existing bank or people who've come out of a bank, they will know the whole gamut of issues from conduct through to prudential issues. If you are dealing with people who understand that there's a regulatory issue that they need to look at and have recruited somebody with a background, again, they are getting there. If they're people who are very tech, they may argue with you. Charles may have experience of this. They may have argue with you and not want to accept your advice. And it can at times be very difficult to convince some of them why certain rules apply and others do not. Um, we have seen people from, uh, how can I say, um, unconscionable people who basically say, well, it can be accessed via the web, so why do we care? Um, I think we, we always obviously advise them that you can't take that view um, and I think that there is more of a global clampdown around um, regulation um, but still there are enough operators out there which give the industry a bad name I mean Bitcoin is still the way in which criminals get away with things but clearly precisely because it leaves a trace um, the, 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 the enforcement authorities are now starting to be on the heels of people who try and use Bitcoin for those sorts of purposes and that's really interesting but uh, Tom, may I? I'd really like to just comment on some of the points which Charles and James were making before um, around um, around uh, around crypto and around 
um, you know, retail customers. And I, I was going to say, I completely agree with Charles that people, we're not going to be able to stop this because this is a, an asset class where you can actually make some money. I mean, putting your, your money in a bank account or in securities, you're just never going to get the same return. I mean, you were telling the story about your ether right at the beginning. Um, while those returns are out there, people are going to want to get into it. So I think the key thing that needs to happen is around transparency and around explaining to people that, and this is where I think the industry is going wrong. We're calling these things coins. They are not coins. They do not operate like bank accounts. If you lose your private key, you are in trouble. And there's a lot of, you know, um, assets parked out there precisely because people have lost their coin. I mean, there's that case of a guy, and I've forgotten, I think, Canadian guy who died. And he was the only one who had access to the private key of a lot of assets, crypto assets. So I think it's those sorts of issues which the industry can be better at explaining to people and in effect explaining to them what the risks are, because they it, it does make the asset class unique and different um, and dangerous in some in some respects. The, my there's my two favorite stories on that are the Welsh guy who threw his um, wallet away and he's got some hedge fund to back him to work out within a square kilometer which landfill site the 200 bitcoins in his driver <laughs> in. And the Welsh council won't let him dig it up. <laughs> yeah, things because so and the and there's the other guy who's got some wallet that you've got three goes at guessing the password and he's got some ludicrous number of bitcoin on it and he's guessed twice. So he's got one more go and then it melts it. Um, but yeah, there are some brilliant stories that come up, uh, come up from, from stuff like that. One of the things we haven't covered yet, which is given a lot of attention in the press and it's certainly been the, I mean, obviously every time Elon Musk says anything on this, it, it sends the market into a spin, but the whole um, environmental impact of mining and of the crypto industry generally is really interesting from the perspective of on the one angle it's a ludicrous use of extremely large amounts of energy uh, but on the other hand it could be a huge driver towards um, renewable energy and, and innovation in that sector. James, for, for someone involved in the business in there, how do you see uh, is crypto investing compatible with a serious commitment to ESG? Yeah, um, so it's a difficult one to unpack. I think the, the focus of the, the focus of the media tends to be on environment and not really on social and government. So I mean, we could have a completely separate conversation about the, you know social inclusion and you know banking the unbankable and on the positives and some of the negatives around you know the use of financial crime. But then you know what we're doing to combat financial crime. So that's kind of on the social side and, the, and then you know governance side. There's a whole load of other arguments. But really, what we're talking about is is the environment. And I definitely see this as being the, the 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 discussion of the day and yeah elon is kind of jumped on you know a bit on the bandwagon i think i don't think he's he's necessarily leading the discussion but he's when he says something it obviously has a huge impact on the market but we're, we're definitely sort of seeing that there's, there's an interest in this space and how do we how do we you know bring that into into our business model and um you know clearly there are some there are some coins that you know, bitcoin, bitcoin is seen as kind of bad you know bad in this space you know historically just because of the way that they you know the miners are validating transactions but there are other coins that are using different uh, methodologies to do that and you know i'm certainly not an expert in this in this kind of space in, 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 at all but you know, we we work with a coin on our on our platform called Cardano, and they put sustainability at the forefront of 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 everything that they do. And I think we will see more coins that existing coins that have that increasing focus. And I think Ethereum is trying to do things in a more energy efficient way. Um, but we will see other coins, I think, that come out that have that sustainability piece or environmental piece that makes them more attractive in future. But yes, I think, you know, the starting position is a definitely a low base. Yeah. Charles, what's your view on the um, ESG debate around crypto? Yeah, yeah say, same here. So I think one of the great things about uh, crypto is you, you can um, make both sides of every argument. <laughs> As James says, um, there are um, technical answers to it, although Bitcoin is the largest by market capitalization, Ether, which is the second largest, operates on a different method of validating transactions, which is less energy intensive. Uh, and even Bitcoin yesterday, the community have voted through changes um, to the um, 
uh, to the, the underlying code that will improve the energy efficiency of Bitcoin. We also see uh, people putting servers in renewable projects. So uh, it got less attention, but part of the um, story around El Salvador accepting Bitcoin as legal tender is that they're going to do some Bitcoin mining using uh, geothermal energy from a volcano on the island. So um, the, the footprint is somewhat dependent on where the energy comes from. And there are lots of new innovative people, uh, innovative businesses being set up by people who are taking off from renewable and nuclear power stations, the energy that is created, because these things, once you turn them on, you can't turn them off, they just run, and therefore they bid energy to the pool at very low values. So they can make more money and therefore be more efficient, reduce energy costs for consumers, by partnering with um, Bitcoin mining companies. So every question around crypto has at least 50 answers. And each of those answers has at least two or three sides to it. it, it it's an amazing area to get into. And I think the ESG thing, it's a very uh, serious issue. But as, 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 um, as we're sort of unpacking a bit here, just, just um, the top of the iceberg of that gives rise to a whole series of other questions. And, and um, again, supporting James's point, the history of digital money uh, through M-Pesa in Kenya, the, the mobile phone credits, is um, as a, a very significant driver of um, social inclusion, providing banking type services to the unbanked. So I, I think the industry that has developed into the crypto industry has, has got a pretty good history um, around some of these questions. Mm. Rosie, do you have a particular view on how? Yes, I mean, I, I think, Charles, I think the latest was that um, Bitcoin mining takes as much power as the whole of Ireland, I think. Um, it's an incredible st statistic. And I mean, there's an argument which says, well, why don't we just divert all that fantastic renewable energy that people are busy developing away from Bitcoin mining into something more useful. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll put that out there. And you're absolutely right in terms of whether you look at proof of work versus proof of stake type blockchain and how much energy it takes. But I guess you've mentioned in PESA, and I think there's another element of the um, ecosystem to be taken into account. And that's that you might actually get exposure to block to, to Bitcoin or to coin, not necessarily going through the nodes, but effectively going through a custodian who just then holds for you. And I think that is actually that is another form of intermediation, of course, and um, actually kind of uh, um, strange that we're talking about intermediation in a world which is meant to be disintermediated. But I think intermediation possibly will mean that we use less energy for uh, um, for, for, for trading. <laughs> A lot of these things, don't they, 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 what they start out being is very, very different to how they end up. And if it ends up being a world of government-run stable coins and uh, efficient energy, it will be yeah, a reasonably different outcome from uh, what it looked like it was going to be a couple of years ago. Um, okay, so I'm just going to open up um, to the audience to see if anyone has any particular questions for the panel. Um, okay, question one from DC. What would be the one piece of advice you would give to the founder of a new crypto business? Um, James, as a general counsel in a crypto business, you'd be well positioned. Yeah, I think we picked on some of the, some of the points uh, in this discussion. Like, it's not just about having good tech. You know, like Rosalie sort of talks about, you know, the, the the clients that will come, and you know, they've got brilliant tech. But ultimately, you, you've got to build, you've got to build on the foundation of of regulatory compliance. You know, and obviously, you know, maybe we're talk, preaching to the converted here, but um, the the fact is, there is increasing regulation in this space, and you you just got to accept that. And it's not just a UK thing. This is this is global. So you either embrace that and you build upon it, and you leverage that, or or you know, you're going to have to kind of rebuild things in in the future. That would be what my one piece of advice. Um, next question: How would you suggest building a strong relationship with the regulator as a crypto business? Rosalie, I think probably. 
think, I mean, certainly in the UK, we have a principle which is often, which is called principle 11, which is you've got to be open and honest with a regulator. And I think that's a very good guiding um, principle. So I think you've got to think very carefully about when changes happen, what you say, at what point and so on. And I think at the end of the day, um, generally speaking, more information is better than less, but you need to think about how you structure that information. You need to I would say engage with the regulator, but in a structured and informed way. Yeah. This is good. It's from um, Gavin McDade. Is there enough work in the crypto world to become a pure crypto lawyer? Charlie. Uh, yes, I, I'd make, I'm, I'm glad I've got that question because I was going <laughs> to volunteer this and um, hopefully the others will agree. So there, there are two aspects to it. So first, um, I've been in corporate finance and the financial markets for 25 years. I've never been involved in such an interesting, lively, uh, engaging market. The people are just fantastic. So it is really, really great fun to do this work. And equally, I've never seen anything in my career which has a greater imbalance of supply and demand of legal services. As you've said, there aren't many crypto lawyers. There are an awful lot of crypto firms and projects and all of the things that run off it, even if you don't wanna be a crypto lawyer. If you understand this stuff, it will make you a better regulatory lawyer, financial markets lawyer, corporate finance lawyer, all of that work comes off it. It's full service work. So um, people should be seeing this as a huge opportunity. Um, uh, for practicing lawyers. Yeah, even things like litigation, like how you how you you know se secure assets against you know cases if they're digital. There's like there's this as you said, it's a full service thing. So what what could you do as a city lawyer of whatever stripe to develop your reputation and tap into that that demand? Shall we all try that one? <laughs> okay, um, uh, James. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you know, when I'm when I'm looking for crypto lawyers, I'm kind of I'm, I'm looking for people that I know that are working in the space that I that I see talking at these kinds of events and that, who I spot, you know, that are in are genuinely interested and enthusiastic about the community. So I think getting, you know, it's, it's all the basic things about BD, right? It's just getting interested and in, and in, in putting yourself out there. Um, I think a question for you. Um, Question regarding the reluctance of some traditional banks in allowing their customers to deal in crypto spend from their accounts on ramp and off ramp from a crypto platform. What advice would the panel give to a crypto firm whose customers are facing pushback from their banks as to how those customers can use their own funds and what type of recourse might such a customer or firm have available to them? Rosalie, that's a hard one, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I mean, look, I think I think traditional banks are concerned around, you know, um, anti money laundering in particular. I think if the customer is using one of the reputable um, crypto exchanges to get access to the crypto market, then there shouldn't be those concerns because all of those exchanges um, are need to be compliant. So I think that would be my first thing is don't go for something which is unregulated which you've you know which you access via the web but has the big fci warning on it or anything like that i think choose something which is already regulated and then have a conversation with your bank around that because at the end of the day um the bank can ask questions because of course they're worried around suspicious transactions but i think if you show that the way in which you deal and the way in which you engage with the market is completely above board one should be able to convince them, I say, but uh, I've not had to try and do this myself. So James is shaking his head. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think the starting point has to be, you know, use the regulat regulated space for this rather than an unregulated space. But I um, I mean, not, not having done this, but in other areas, um, I can see retail banks are in are incredibly cautious at the moment. I mean, there, a lot has gone on in the COVID times when a lot of uh, retail investors have been sitting behind their computers doing all sorts of things. So uh, I'm, I'm at the sharp end of, you know, setting up a company and trying to get a bank account for it. So yes, um, I can see that uh, they, they could ask some awkward questions. James, you look like you had a view on that. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there are there are certain um, fintechs that I think positioning themselves in a way to get a bit of a you know a story. So I think there's the, there is that angle. But I think if you look at some of the, the more legacy traditional banks, you know, the, the people that are make you know kind of coming up with these these rules and processes and screens that you have to go through, you know, it's the it's the big compliance functions of these firms. So they're not making strategic decisions. It's you know, it's a a burrow of people that are you know have been given a task to do and they're not going to engage with you on a sort of rational you know strategic basis nor will they be interested in the or regulated or that you've got you know whatever registrations you know it's uh it's it's computer says no unfortunately like yeah. Freddie, good luck with that but I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you solve that one um, perhaps the answer is to use one of the more sort of uh, challenger banks one of the fintechs who will perhaps have a better understanding of uh, of the market james yeah i i'd agree so i think that there are a um, small number of UK banks that will bank you as a crypto firm and, and overseas banks as well. Big opportunity for, for banks out there to, to mm -hmm. take a different view. And um, so th this, uh, this will be very familiar to the three of us who were talking, but just to get it in perspective for, the, um, for anyone in the audience who, um, <laughs> who is sceptical uh, of Bitcoin. So... The most recent statistics around uh, Bitcoin's use in financial crime is, is um, estimated to be around 0.5% of Bitcoin used in financial crime. In fiat, the wider economy, that's 5%. So I think we need to have um, a, a perspective around that question when mm -hmm. people are, are negative about crypto in that context. And the, related to that question from Laura Bates, um, do you expect the FCA to look at crypto firms under principle five of the FCA remonitoring client activity for market abuse in the crypto space? Rosalie. Um, it depends on what your crypto asset is, of course, because if your crypto asset is one which is within the scope of a market abuse regime, then absolutely yes. Um, I think that, um, and then, so that's the market abuse regime, and then the question is, will they then extend that to the principle, because of course the principle is not as limited as a uh, um, as, as the actual regulation, or in fact, the UK version of the regulation. And I would say that if the firm is, um, if the firm is within the scope of regulation, then I think that principle five will be something that the FCA is going to look at because they'll look at the firm on an enterprise wide basis. So even where you do things which are within the unregulated space, and there were cases around this a long time ago, if you do market abuse in relation to unregulated business um, and you are regulated yourself, then I think that there will be questions to be answered. Yeah. James, you have a view on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I don't think I've got much to add. I, I, absolutely, it's it's it, if you're if you fall within that securities regime, you know, you know why, why wouldn't you? It's not something that I've 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 seen in the in the space in which we operate currently, and we op operate outside that security space. And we, we're about to end. Um, the last question: What's the panelists' favorite anecdote from the cryptocurrencies world? I think my favorite one on that was the guy at Goldman who announced he's retiring because he invested in Dogcoin before it went up by about a million percent, um, which I thought was good. And I heard a rumor that he hadn't actually sold out after, but I still imagine he's done fairly well. But I just love the idea of some partner at Goldman Sachs bunging a hundred grand into Dogcoin because he didn't have anything else to do with it. <laughs> retiring a month later, hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, anyone else have any? Uh, particularly enjoyable I, I love the whole one coin story i think it's just it's it's a really interesting story in organizational behavior and, and human psychology and the fact that despite you know it being really publicized that it was a you know a huge ponzi scheme there are still people out there that are buying into it and selling it so uh, and there's a brilliant podcast on um if you haven't listened to about about this so i would really recommend that okay charlie yeah, I, I, so I'd say rather than uh, stories, some of which are probably um, unprintable, um, come and meet the people. So you get, get to know the three of us and come and meet the community. There are some just stunning people there for, for, of, of, of every type. Uh, and there are people who, um, uh, who are from the libertarian perspective, from the institutional perspective, from all kinds of, of representing different groups in between. And they are, they're, they're just the, the, 
the greatest people. You know, there, there is a support around the community and people who are helping themselves and who remember who's helped them. So I, I think for anyone listening, you know, it's it, it can be hard to find this stuff and, and the point in education that uh, there aren't really textbooks that are coming, uh, textbooks, but you've got to kind of, you've got to be interested, as Jane says, you've got to like the stuff, you've got to kind of dabble in it, you've got to play with the technology, you've got to get into DeFi, that's coming. We've, we've not touched on DeFi, but that's going to be the biggest thing. And come and meet the people. They're very open to this stuff. There are lots of meetups, there are lots of events, and people would love to see them. Uh, in, are, there, are there any are there any cross-industry initiatives or any cross-industry groups or things that you, you guys have had experience with that you think are, they're, are good and you would you would want to give a shout out to? Yeah, Go UK, I think for one, is a good organisation for people that work in that space. I'll say Erica Stanford's Crypto Curry Club. They're fantastic. Yeah, Crypto Curry Club, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, look, we're coming up to the end of our hour. Um, so look, it's all that's left for me to do is say a huge thank you to Rosalie, James and Charles um, for some absolutely brilliant advice and uh insights into what is a fantastic area of financial services. And I think the thing Charlie said at the beginning, which was you know, just the, the how this is going to change the interface that people have with finan their normal financial services from stuff that came out of crypto is super interesting in of itself, let alone the opportunities and the risks that need managing for this as a sector. Um, so guys, thank you all so much for giving up uh, a time. That was a, a fantastic session. I just add on that bit, Tom, that, that I think a, a way of thinking about this that I, I think I'm tuning into is, this is to finance what the metaverse is to the internet. Uh, and if that explains it to people who are listening and just seeing the implications of the metaverse for the first time, this is how they should be thinking about crypto. Perfect, that's a perfect way to end. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Um, we will be, doing another webinar next quarter um, and we've got a number of new uh, general counselling podcasts coming out soon. Um, the next of which is one of our diversity specialists, specials with Tuvia Barak from Goldman Sachs and M. Masbalavi from uh, Clifford Chance. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in.